All right. Welcome to another episode of Purchase to Profits. I'm Seth Ferguson. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss our daily interviews with successful real estate investors. And I've put together the top seven key market drivers I look at when analyzing a real estate market. Go to sethferguson.org to download your free copy. Our guest today has five years of experience in real estate and has overseen $25 million of multifamily acquisitions with an internal rate of return exceeding 20%. James Candesami is principal at Achieve Investment Group. James, welcome to Purchase Your Profits. It's great to have you on the show. Hey, Seth. uh, Very nice to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, we're really looking forward to this. And uh, we were just talking before we started recording. Uh, You've got your own podcast too. So tell us a little bit about your podcast. Oh, my podcast is called Achieve Wealth Through Value at Real Estate Investing. Um, I repeat, achieve wealth through value at real estate investing. It focuses a lot on commercial real estate operators uh, and different asset class. So I focus a lot on uh, multifamily or apartments, but I try to you know, bring other asset class as well. So that sounds great. Yeah. And I'm sure we've, uh, we'll, we'll share some guests back and forth because we, we've had some uh, pretty big hitters on the show. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just to one more clarify, uh, to clarify is like we are actually almost at uh, $100 or million in asset value now. Oh, wow. Okay, so you will have to update your bio. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I must have sent you the old bio. But yeah, yeah we have like 1300 units across uh, eight properties and uh, asset value of around more than 100 uh, million dollars. Nice. Well, so speaking of assets under management, um, what are your goals now for real estate? Where are you looking to take real estate? So my goal is, I mean, uh, for me, it's all about solving problems, right? Uh, I love solving problems. If I can find an, another real estate problem to solve, I would do it, right? Um, but the goals are basically to close 600 units by end of this year. Um, we're on track for that. Um, and, uh, you know, just making sure we're buying the deals that make sense. Sometimes when you put goal and sometimes you're forced to buy some deals and I do not want to do that because, you know, markets are peak right now and sometimes when you put aggressive goal you tend to make mistakes of buying you know marginal deals or just because you put a goal right so so i don't want to you know uh, buy deal just because of buying deals but i just want to make sure we buy deals which has a true upside today right um because as i said it's very hot out there in terms of marketplace and we want to make sure that we buy deals that we're able to uh, fulfill our business plan for our passive investors. Yeah. And how do you approach underwriting deals now? Because you mentioned, you know, the, the good deals are hard to come by. Um, and sometimes it's easy to, you know, change the numbers on the spreadsheet if you really want to make it work. So how do you stay focused on your criteria and, and not deviate? Oh, it's very easy to change things on spreadsheet, right? Yeah. So a spreadsheet is a spreadsheet, right? So I think the way we look at deals, which has been since day one, is basically to look for building upside. Building upside means today's upside. What is it, right? So if I, without changing the, anything in the world right now, without appreciation, without economy doing well, uh, if, the, if, if does the property has that potential that not being realized yet, which needs me to go and either put my own money, not my own money, my the capital into the property so that I can improve the um, the condition of the property and increase rent. Or I can go and in, uh, improve the management side of it where I can uh, reduce expense. So, and I don't really look for appreciation in the, you know, the 3% or 2% rent appreciation, even though it may increase, I'm, I may just, I plug that in into third year onwards, uh, you know, but I think in the beginning, the first two years or the first one year, I usually look for what is the building upside? What can I bring to the table to realize that building upside? Yeah. You're really looking at what you can control, right? Exactly. Exactly. What, what I can go and do things with my own effort. Yeah. 100%. And what would you say is your number one challenge now with your business? Um, of course, I think the number one challenge is finding the right deal. Right, uh, finding deals has always been the challenge right now. So, because, um, as I said, everybody is looking at apartments, and we specialize in it, and um, you know everything is getting overpriced, and everything is going through bidding process, which means you know you are going to be paying the highest price unless you have something special that no one else has. Yeah, um, yeah, finding deals is always hard right now. 
Yeah. So looking back uh, five years ago when you first started, how has your marketing efforts changed in order to uh, increase your deal flow? Because the market was different five years ago until now. So what changes have you made? I think in, in general, market did not change for the past five years. When I started past five years, people say everything's expensive. Even now people are saying it's very expensive, right? So uh, I think it maybe it just got more competitive now because there's so many more people knows about it, right? I remember when I started in 2013, uh, I was buying single family, but when I started in 2015, uh, everything was like hard to find deals, hard to find deals, right? Because um, that's what happened when the economy is booming, right? So my marketing effort has changed a lot when I started in the beginning, I started, when I started in the beginning, I used, uh, you know, cold texting or yellow letter marketing to find deals, uh, including single family and also multifamily. So my first two deals I found using off market strategy. And after that, uh, there's more deals coming in. I'm a player in the market. There's brokers are bringing me off market and I've become much better underwriter because now we know how the operation works. Right. And, um, we have built a much bigger team. So we're able to, you know, get more deals done. Yeah. And, and going from those single family assets to multifamily, what changes did you have to make in how you thought about real estate uh, in order to make that move? Uh, working through people in multifamily because multifamily your apartment is basically more of a business where you get to work with the property manager, true property manager. I mean, right now, now we have regionals working for us. So we have to enable them. How do you empower them? You know, train them to take care of the property. I mean, single family was like, we are doing everything ourselves, right? Um, but I think it's an important step, right? To do that, you know, transition where you were dealing directly with the tenant to a business, right? Because whatever you're putting in your underwriting spreadsheet is actually a tenant behavior, right? If you're saying this tenant is going to pay $100 more for this newly remodeled unit, then you're representing an increase of like, uh, you know, how much you're actually representing that into the spreadsheet. And when you're saying that, oh, now the tenants in this submarket is going to be, uh, there's a lot of demand in the submarket, they're going to increase their rent by 3% every year. You're basically representing that 3%. Of, I mean, you're representing their behavior as a percentage, right? So, so knowing that tenant level base uh, appetite and how do they behave it's very key for anybody uh, to start in, uh, you know, rental business, including single family and also multifamily. So, so we are very appreciative of uh, starting with single family. Yeah. And it, that's interesting. Um, some people will say, you know, I, if I could go back in time, I just would focus on multifamily from the start. And other people will say that, you know, they were glad they started with single family. Do you think it's necessary to, you know, start off with, you know, a smaller asset like single family? I think it's absolutely necessary. I mean, yeah. people, you cannot skip, uh, you cannot go to high school by skipping uh, elementary or kindergarten, right? Mm -hmm. You probably can be a champion, a bull run, but when the market turns, your priority will be different, right? Your priority is now, how do I take care of tenants, mm -hmm. right? And if you have never had that single family experience where you do the lease contract and talk to them about their, how do they should take care of their behavior in the property? How do they should maintain What's the income ratio? You know, uh, you do not know how to evict them. Uh, if you don't have that experience, you basically have skipped a lot of things and you have gone to the peak of the market and uh, you basically missed out a lot of education and experience. And uh, that is absolutely necessary when the market is turning around. Because when the market is turning around, your retention becomes very critical, yeah. right? So now you have to figure out how do I retain these people, right? I mean, if you're just buying and living into third party property management, you do not know how to retain. Now the property management guys are going to come and say, Oh, you need to pay me additional 2% of property management because I need to do this additional stuff to retain. And you're going to be like, Oh, okay. That's what it is. Right. So, because you have been always, Oh, okay. In the beginning from beginning, right. Just that the original, the, the earlier, Oh, okay. Is during the market boom, which you don't have to do much effort. Yeah. And, you know, you bring up a good point. And there's lots of investors now um, that have entered the real estate game where, you know, they haven't been around for 10, 12 years. So they haven't seen both ends of the, of the market cycle. Um, what sort of advice would you give somebody who's maybe just entered real estate investing in the past five years and they haven't experienced the downside? Well, that's including me, right? So yeah. <laughs> I've never gone through the downside. Oh, that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes a bit scary, you know, because you don't know what you do not know, right? So uh, I don't know whether I'm the right guy to advise or not. Oh. I, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm I, I, I guess I set you up. Uh, yeah. So, so <laughs> well, but that's okay. That's absolutely 
a valid uh, question uh, because as I said, everybody's a champ in a bull market, right? So, um, but I would say that if you realize that your property has increased in value because of your, your own effort, you have done something right, right? A lot of people have increased value just because of market have boomed, right? Now they go and tell everybody, I made 200%, I made 300%, but it's not because of your own effort, right? So if you have identified your own effort, that means you have done good. And that is very key when the downturn happens because now you need to know and go back and redo that again. Yeah. And uh, for, for myself, I got into real estate in 2008. Um, so it's, uh, it's interesting to see, you know, like you were saying, uh, you know, in the boom period, you don't really have to push as hard to attract the tenants. Um, but it was, it was interesting to see how, you know, pricing becomes so important with how you're positioning yourself in the market. Um, it, because if your pricing's off a little bit, you have so much more competition. If vacancy uh, goes up, uh, you know, you can just have units sitting, <laughs> sitting like sitting like sitting ducks for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Pricing and also like how competent is your property management company, right? Especially in the apartment business that we are in, right? So yeah. Because the competency of property management is not well tested in this current boom market. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, so let, uh, tell us a little bit about how you got up and running because right now you're at uh, around $100,000 assets under management. Um, walk us through the past five years. Like, how did you get the ball rolling to kick things off? So we started with single family. I mean, we have started just with 50000 in the beginning, right? That's our spot like maybe... I think uh, on average, I think the houses I was buying like six to 8,000 cash down payment, which is really low, right? Uh, okay. But we use uh, this Burr method where you buy and refi. And so we're able to go in with a very low amount of money. Then we refinance that money and we bought another 10 more, another, not another five to six more houses. So from that, all that 11 houses, which is rental and two flips, so total 13, we build up like almost 400,000 of equity. Nice. And from 400,000 equity, we moved to, we refinanced that money out and moved to uh, some of the single family. And now we are selling all our single family. So we moved to multifamily, 45 units. Um, and then the next year we bought 174 units. And the year after we bought 115. And past two years, we bought another, what, almost 1,000 units. Nice. So are, are you, are you con like, what's your, what's your bread and butter? Are you focusing on hundred units plus or 50 units? Like what, what's your niche? Uh, we like to look at more than hundred units, but we like more than 200 units as our bread and butter. Gotcha. Class yeah. B and C with value add component yeah. to it. Yeah. And, and lots of the listeners on the show, they're, they're either beginners or intermediates in real estate investing. So can you just walk us through, um, you know, because moving from single family to multifamily, the network is different. Uh, the people who you need to know is different. So how, how did you go about um, exposing yourself to the people operating in the multifamily space? I think there's a lot of uh, channels to network, right? I mean, I wrote a book on, on passive investing in commercial real estate is on Amazon right now. So I did outline like, in general, there's four ways to network for passive investors and active investors. First is bigger pockets, right? It's, it's free. Go and ask thousands of questions. There are a lot of people who will answer your question. And second is meetups, right? Just Google, go to meetup.com and look at whatever asset class you want to do. So if you like apartments, go and Google it. Just go and visit, right? Uh, third would be, you know, like uh, real estate clubs, right? Your local real estate club. Fourth will be your paid real estate club as well. So there's four ways to go around it. Uh, I started with, with bigger pocket, absolutely. And I, I, did, I didn't do so much of uh, meet up by did the investment clubs as well so where we can go and meet up with the like-minded people yeah and and in terms of raising capital um how did you that's a struggle a lot of new people have that they don't realize you know how how their approach is in terms of raising capital how, how did you find success with it uh starting basically fresh uh in the multifamily space i think capital should not be a problem at this this market cycle, right? This market cycle is supposed to be a lot of capital, less deals, right? The downturn is like <laughs> too, many, too much deal, less capital, right? So yeah. if someone is struggling to raise capital now, so there's a few things. One is they do not know how to really, really um, 
represent the business to another investor, right? And and the only way you can represent that business is you just you just can't say this is a really good investment. It'll make a, you know six to ten percent return. You can't do that, right? But you have to really know your subject matter, right? Uh, when someone asks you how do you increase your rent, right? So you should be able to explain very detail on how are you going to go about. And the only way you can go detail is if you know your subject matter and a lot of people are trying to raise money without knowing the subject matter because they just want to be part of the GP, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. So uh, I would say anybody who want to raise money, who want to really, really get credibility from passive investors, you know, make sure you know how to underwrite a deal, right? When you underwrite a deal, you can always talk in terms of business plan, right? And whenever passive investors come and give you money and you know, they're going to expect you to explain to them what's the business plan, how is it doing for the business plan, you know, if you are just uh, raising money for others, uh, you may not know that level of detail. I mean, so you have to defer a lot to the operator, right? So, mm-hmm. um, so I think it's important that people know underwriting the deal. How do you find deals and all that, right? So, um, I think that's that's the gist of it. Yeah, for for sure. And in terms of finding uh, passive investors to speak mm-hmm. with, um, what strategy did you find worked best for you? I think you, uh, you have to talk about your successes whenever you meet your um, passive, new passive investors and you, you should be able to explain, like for example, someone asks you, hey, what do I get from this uh, investment, right? Yeah, you can talk about like, yeah, we get cash flow, we get IRR and all that, but if you're able to explain, hey, you know, you, you can take money from this self-directed IRA or QRP, right? Or you can talk about, hey, you know, there's a tax benefit to it. Hey, then they ask you, how do you explain the tax benefit? And I can tell you 95% of the people can't really explain how the tax benefit kicks in, Yeah. right? Uh, unless you're a real estate professional, it's very simple to answer, but most of the passive investors are not real estate professionals, right? Yeah. But how do you explain the tax benefit? How do you explain the tax conversion from high tax bracket to low tax bracket? If you're able to explain all that, people know this guy really know his stuff. And they would establish that trust, right? I mean, they're giving like, what, 25,000, 50,000, 200,000, 300,000 to a person. They need to know that, they need to make sure that this guy know what they're talking about. Yeah. So learn learn all that details. You know, then it's much more convincing to uh, passive investors. But I think the ultimate reason why, like for, for us, we have raised $25 million without using any capital raises on our own, right? Uh, because we have done really, really well in our deals, right? We started with 45 units. We did very, very well. We did tell a lot of people. So now that, that four to five people which invested with us told another 10, 20 people. So now when I do my second deal, we're able to raise very quickly because you have a good track record. And the first, you know, we have, we have always been having good track record and people have been telling other people and referral and people just, uh, referral is the best business, right? So um, people just keep on uh, coming back to us. Yeah, good stuff. Um, so is there a Keystone deal that comes to mind that made a big impact on you and your business? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have a few Keystone, but uh, the biggest would be um, in our second deal where we bought 174 units. Uh, we bought it at 6.9 million. We put in like one and a half million dollars into it. And after 12 months, that uh, what... Uh, was that 7.5 is that right 8.5 million dollars become 13 million dollar deal uh in 12 months and we refinance uh, all the cash out of pocket that we put in which is like 3.9 million dollars and gave it back to all our investors and they're still in the deal we, we get a free building in 12 months uh it's an infinite cash flow return yeah and, and that's the most beautiful position to be in in real estate investing yeah, yeah, especially in commercial, right? I mean, uh, the difference between single family and commercial is commercial, you have that opportunity to do false appreciation where you can go and put your own sweat equity and do that. Right? You can never do this in single family, right? Uh, you can't force appreciate a value in single family. Uh, I mean, single family do have other advantages, but I think in commercial, you know, you can do this kind of uh, a value add and pulled out tons and tons of money. I mean, this deal, we almost pulled out $5 million uh, out of the deal. That's, the, that's great. So how did you source the deal? Was it through a broker? Did you go direct to seller? It went direct to seller. Yeah, that was the first two deals that we did, which we got direct from the sellers. Yeah. And, um, and when you found the opportunity, what was it that stuck out at you? Like, was it location? Like, what, what made you say, hey, listen, we should take a closer look? 
Well, you don't get a lot of deals in off market, right? So we got this one deal. <laughs> so this was the second deal. And uh, I, well, what stuck out, it was in a really good location. It was in a distressed situation, but still was like around 90% occupied. But you just need a lot of work, exterior and interior. So I know there's a lot of value add in it. So that was what um, um, brought me, uh, I mean, gave me the confidence to you know, buy that deal. Yeah. And, and that was a big jump in unit count because you started with 45? 45 and 174, yeah. yes. Correct. Yeah. So um, lots of people would be scared to jump up to that big. Um, what gave you the confidence to make the leap? Uh, just trying to think big. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, after 174, I was looking for much bigger units, but I got 115, which was nearby to 174. But that came through a broker, but still it was a really good value add. Yeah. And, and in terms of the value add process, uh, you talked about this one was, you know, in a distressed situation, though occupancy was still okay. Um, but did you have any hiccups along the way in terms of the renovations? Oh, there's tons and tons of hiccups. You know, one and a half million dollar of renovation within 12 months is not an easy renovation, right? So, yeah, there was a lot of hiccups. Yeah. <laughs> like, like contractor not starting on time, um, you know, we are going over budget on something, we are under budget on something. How do you decide on what to spend money on? There's a lot of decisions that we make as, a, as an operator. Yeah. So what lessons did you pick up in terms of running the management of the construction side um, that you've taken to future deals um, in terms of streamlining the process? I think the important lessons that we learned in that deal was primarily how do we you know, balance between contractor qualities versus the speed of the renovation, right? Because we have like 174 units. And now after we buy from 90%, 90, I think we were like 93 or 92%. And then we went down to like 77% within two months, right? So we are like doing a lot of house cleaning, but the problem is um, a lot of, uh, how, do we, how do we recover that? occupancy again so the only way to recover is to rehab it quickly because we could not get started on the exterior we got bits after bits but exterior got slowed down so so what we did is we got three different contractors right from craigslist and everybody started working and and we after a few weeks of work we know who's working and who's not working and we start firing each one of them and we got the best guys and we just give them a lot more work right and they were able to turn around very quickly so contractor management selection how do you you know fire them if they're not working, you know, uh, that's key uh, skills that we learned. Yeah, for, for sure. And uh, you've done the refi, you've pulled out a big chunk of equity. Um, mm -hmm. are, what, what's your plan going forward with this property? Are you looking at holding it for another five years or? We are still holding it, uh, you know, but we do not know. I mean, we review our plans every year after year. Um, DICE has still got Quite, quite a number of equity stuck in that deal, right? At least another, you know, four to five million dollars stuck, right? So we are, I mean, the property is stabilized, it's cash flowing nicely to our investors, it's, it's, like, it's infinite return right now. So, so uh, we will decide uh, as the year goes by and we'll talk to our investors on what to do, but it's still a really good investment now. Oh yeah, and you never know, somebody might come along with a really big check for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, we have to evaluate at that time, I guess. Yeah, yeah, for, for sure. So uh, tell us about the impact um, moving into commercial real estate has had on you and your family. Oh, huge, huge. I think, uh, of course, we got a lot more busier, but I was able to uh, resign from my W2 job almost like, what, almost one and a half year to two years ago. So now I'm a lot more, at home, uh, I sleep a lot more too, which is not that great. <laughs> but <laughs> but we just have so much of flexibility in terms of uh, family time. I live in Austin, so the traffic's bad. So, but I can always go out from eleven to two to anywhere in Austin and come back so that I don't hit the traffic. So, it gives you a lot more time, a lot more wealth as well. But I mean, time is more critical, and you're running it as a business, so you have people working under you, and you're just you know working from home most of the time. Yeah. And at what point did you decide in your business that you needed to start hiring other people to do other tasks? Uh, we always have a property management company on our own. Um, so we had property managers there, but after around thousand units, we said we need a regional. So we have a regional right now. And we also have a construction manager because there's so much of uh, you know construction going on in different part of the town and 
and property and you know different lenders draws all kind of things so we have these two people helping us right now yeah do, do you wish you hired those people sooner um it's um well, I think a thousand units is more of a, the right place where you start to hire that kind of people to help you out. Yeah, 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 I, absolutely. The, no, the only reason I'm asking is I, I find a lot of people beginning in real estate, um, they, they put off hiring because they want to do everything on their own. And then they almost gets to a point where it's too late and then they bring people in at the last minute. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think I would say like, uh, you know, like admin assistant would be really, really useful. I mean, on top of these two people that working directly on a payroll right now, I have a, I have a quite a number of VAs working for me to do small tasks. And I just assume that it, it could have been better to get them on board earlier. I just got them on board after like 700 units. So because admin assistant can really, really help your time out. Yeah. And, and it takes off so much stress. Yeah. yeah. There's so much of uh, trivial stuff that we do that we really don't have to do, but um, but getting an assistant and all that, you need to train them. And, you know, as long as you're getting a VA, which you don't pay on a payroll, then you're good. Yeah, no, for, for sure. Good advice. Um, so let's look ahead 10 years from now. Um, mm -hmm. Where do you see yourself in your portfolio in a decade? So I'm trying to go like, you know, I, I mean, I sometimes buying this 200, 300 units become monotonous, right? So I'm trying to see how do I make a leap, right? <laughs> so... So how do I make a leap to much, much bigger transaction? It may not be a apartment, it's something big, but uh, where you are able to uh, leverage your time much more effectively, right? Uh, um, so I haven't figured that out yet where I'm going to be, what I'm going to be doing in 10 years, but it's going to be a huge leap from what I'm doing right now. Yeah. Well, have you considered uh, opening a fund versus syndication? Fund is not that big de big deal. I mean, fund is fun, right? I mean, I can open a fund right now, but the thing is I don't like to hold people's money because when you hold people's money, you might be pressured to buy deals and when pressure that kind of things happen, you might be buying the wrong deals, right? Yeah. So, right, and, and the investors are going to be asking you, when do I get return, right? So I'll give you the money, right? So, so I'm trying to figure out what's the balance between that. I think that's that absolutely an advantage of having a fund if you use it right, but I need to figure out how do I structure it so you know there's a balance between holding somebody else's money without giving them huge return um, versus you know using that fund to the uh, optimal usage of it. Yeah, no, for, for sure. Well, we'll have to have you back on next year and then you can uh, <laughs> let us know how, how things are going. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. That's perfect. Well, James, um, if somebody's looking to uh, reach out, get in touch with you, learn more about you and your company, uh, where can they find you? Uh, you can, they can reach me from uh, direct to my email, james at Achieve Investment Group. Achieve is like achieving a goal, A-C-H-I-E-V-E. -E. james at Achieve Investment Group com, And my website is Achieve Investment Group com. I also have a book in Amazon. It's called Passive Investing in Commercial Real Estate, The Insider Secrets. Um, so look up for me, that's like 32, five or 34, five star reviews right now. I have a podcast, achieve wealth through value at real estate investing. Look up my podcast. And I also have a awesome Facebook group. Uh, it's almost 2000 people right now. It's spam free. Uh, it's called multifamily investors group, multifamily investors group. You guys can reach me and I'm available in Facebook and LinkedIn too. Perfect. Well, James, just want to say thanks so much for taking the time and uh, sharing some really great tips with us. Well said. Thank you for having me in the show. Happy yeah, to be here. It was my pleasure. And to you, our viewers, I wish you well on your journey from purchase to profits. See you next time.